Well, hi everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Kim and I'm one of the event hosts at Pals Books here in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I wanna encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website, pals.com. One of the many events we're looking forward to is Alice Hoffman in conversation with Anne Leary for Hoffman's new book, Magic Lessons. That event is this Tuesday, the 20th. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Meryl Marco and Robin Schiff. Marco was the head writer for the original The David Letterman Show, the live NBC morning show, which was recognized with a Daytime Emmy Award. She shared in three Primetime Emmy Awards for outstanding writing for a variety series for her work on Late Night with David Letterman. She engineered most of the original concepts and architecture for the groundbreaking late night talk show and created the segment Stupid Pet Tricks, as well as Stupid Human Tricks and Viewer Mail. Many of the ideas behind the remote segments outside the studio came from Marco, who also won a Writers Guild Award for her writing and performing work on HBO's Not Necessarily the News. She's also written for television shows such as New Heart, Sex in the City, and Moonlighting. Marco has written for many periodicals, including Rolling Stone, Time, New York Woman, New Woman, U.S. News and World Report, U.S., or sorry, Us, People, Esquire, New York Times, and L.A. Times. She is author of four books of essays and four novels. Most recently, her cartoons have appeared in The New Yorker. Marco's new book, We Saw Scenery, is the comedy writer's first ever graphic memoir. Marco unearthed her treasured diaries long kept under lock and key to illustrate the hilarious story of her preteen and teen years and how she came to realize that her secret power was her humor. We Saw Scenery is a laugh out loud story of a girl growing up told from the perspective of the woman she became and speaking to all who wanted to understand themselves in the midst of their own maturing. Joining Marco in conversation this evening is Robin Schiff. Schiff has numerous television credits and most recently worked on the new Darren Star series, Emily in Paris. She's best known for writing and producing Rami and Michelle's High School Reunion, which she is currently adapting as a musical for the stage. She was a member of the famed LA improv troupe, The Groundlings, which is where she honed her comedy skills. An LA native, Robin has a degree in history from UCLA. In her free time, she likes to read, nap, and watch TV. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question, as well if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking on the thumbs up. Most importantly, please consider supporting Meryl and Pals by purchasing a copy of her new book from us. I'll put a link um, to purchase the book at Pals in the chat this evening. Without further ado, Meryl and Robin, it is such a pleasure to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the lovely introduction and thank you, Robin, for agreeing to do this. I was excited to do it because I love your book. And I, and Powell's, you haven't been to Powell's, but Powell's is just the greatest independent bookstore. I mean, that's, have, what I, that's what I have heard. heard. So I want to just start out by saying how you and I know each other. We are very good friends now, but I started out as your fan and I'm still your fan, but I remember the morning show and my friend Jean and I, who were pretty lazy, would get up at night. It was on at 9 a.m. in LA and we would live, get- Live, by the way, it was live. Live, and I would get up and watch it um, and talk to my best friend on the phone and we and I couldn't believe that there was some woman named Meryl Marco, because you did on camera stuff too, that was a writer. And, and it had never occurred to me that a woman could be a comedy writer. So it was hugely influential. And then I noticed when you went to Letterman and- um, You mean The Night Show? The what show? Well, when you say Letterman, you mean the one that followed, the one that was came on at yes, night? Yes, 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 the, the night show. Um, but um, so I followed your career there too. And then many years later, 
I heard through my agent, I had written Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion and the studio didn't think it was funny enough. <laughs> and they kept trying to bring people on to fix the script. And it got back to me that this, one of my idols, Meryl Marco, refused to rewrite the script because she said there was nothing wrong with it. Yeah, there was nothing wrong with it. You know, and this, this is a twofold example of everything about me that you need to know about me. One, I was right. There was nothing wrong with it. And two, that's how I completely screwed up my career. Is <laughs> You're supposed to just do it anyway and collect the money. But I, I operate on a weird set of principles that nobody shares. Well, it was, it was just at a time when I was really um, low because this, the studio is trying to replace me to have that get back to me it was just a huge boost and then we have a mutual friend the novelist Miss, uh, Maria Semple and I said I want to meet Meryl Marco and she uh, set us up for dinner but she literally uh, knows everyone does she not she knows everyone she knows everyone but what year was Meryl Marco's Guide to Love I'm just trying to feel figure out if I read that before I knew you or not um, well, you know, uh, I don't know, some place in the early, in the late 80s or the early 90s, and I don't, re I don't know exactly. I think it was early 90s, because I think my first book ever came out in the early 90s, so someplace in the 90s. But I read that, and that was one of the, um, <laughs> Maria, <laughs> hi, Maria, <laughs> that's so exciting. That is exciting. <laughs> um, well, she's responsible. Without Maria, I would not. Uh, I would not be sitting here. So, Meryl, I just love this book so much, and I feel like it made me remember so much of my own junior high years. They're such um, vivid years and such a turbulent time. But why don't you? talk a little bit about how you even got the idea. How did you come across the diaries and how did you get the idea to illustrate them? Well, um, uh, I was cleaning out my office. Actually, I'm gonna try to do a screen share here so you can see, cause some of this stuff is in the book. Let's see if my screen share works. Okay. Did it work? Yep. It says dear. Okay, so those are the diaries. Now let's see if you can turn the page here. No, not yet. This is iffy at best. Yeah, so this is my office. I save a lot of crap because I'm a writer and I, every time I see anything that I think is funny, I feel I should save it in case I ever need it to write about it. And most of it is just ridiculous and there's no reason to save it, but I save it anyway and then it fills up boxes of crap. So every now and again, I have to weed out the stuff and just see what it is I'm saving. And um, here's an example of some of the things that I saved. Um, I liked uh, who's who in the lunch meat industry because I thought the lunch meat industry was funny for some reason. Same with fresh hair, you know, uh, and um, rejuvenate your sacred sexuality. These were all things I found funny and so I was saving and had to figure out a way to throw away. And uh, what, let me see what my next thing is. Yeah, oh, what were you well, saving that for though? Was this like when you well, were... Leave, um, leave screen share now. Stop share. Am I back? Yeah. Well, what did you, what were you going to do with it? You were saving it for what? To be what, saving all those things? You know, I just think, I think I'm going to, maybe it's the training from writing for the Letterman show, but I just think there's going to be something that will be really funny that I can do with them. So I need to remember them. And then I can't find a file for them because the, each file would be individually named because there's no place to, where do you put who's who in the lunch meat industry? Nowhere, except for a <laughs> file that says, lunch meat industry <laughs> there's there's no need for a, a file that says lunch meat industry there's not going to be another one anyway at the bottom of one of these boxes of crap i found this little pile of diaries and here is an actual one so and, you uh, literally had the diary that said dear diary with a lock and key man yeah and that was the thing that made me laugh is it had a lock and a key because the person who wrote the stuff in here was about 10, 11, and, uh, and I'm just wondering, what was I writing that was so valuable that you had to protect it uh, that way? <laughs> because I'm not writing anything nearly that, that important now. So, uh, so I thought, well, I should sit down and read these as though they were an important piece of literature and just see if that's anything. 
So I started doing that. And um, uh, now I'm going to go back to screen share again. Um, this is a page <laughs> that <clears throat> well, my mother bought me these diaries for like birthdays and stuff. And I, I didn't know what you do with a diary. So I, I thought the idea was you have to put something on every page. So uh, oftentimes I forgot to do any entries at all. And then I go back and I think that's what these were as I went back and uh, added something. <laughs> Just because I, because I didn't like there to be any blank pages. Anyway, um, now I'm going to leave screen share again. This is annoying, isn't it? Where do I leave screen share? You, but you're, you never went to screen share. Oh, I didn't? No. Oh, well then let me try it again. All right. I'm seeing it. Um, now do you see it? Yep. But is it's it a diary page? Yep. But you can't. You, you can't see yeah, it? Yeah, that's, that's better. Yeah. Okay, it, I'm stopping it now. <laughs> it's, it, it says, I forgot what happened today. Right. It says, I it also says. forgot what happened today. Yeah, they were, I think I did those in retrospect because I was making sure that I filled out a page. Every page was supposed to be something. So, but most of the pages do have things on them and they were uh, a weird record of a kid's life, the kind of stuff that I would never write in a diary now. You know, I'm, they were, I listed every assignment I had in school. I listed every movie I saw, every television show that I was watching. I wrote what the plot was. I was, that, that was my idea of what you were supposed to put in a diary. And, um, and so I started to think it was kind of funny. And I also wanted to see what it looked like because I had no particular memory of writing a lot of this stuff, but I, I did have a memory just generally of the time, but not specifically. So I thought, well, it might be interesting to just kind of flesh it out and see what this kid looked like in context. And, um, and so I started doing these drawings and, uh, did you I think, kept doing oh, these I'm make a book? I'm gonna make a I'm gonna do these drawings and make a book or what No, was... I started doing these drawings and then I, I thought I'd make a comic strip at first. I thought it might be funny to have a comic strip that was actually written by a 10-year-old from another era. <laughs> or an eleven year old, an actual one. And then I I wasn't sure if I was gonna comment on them or anything. I, I went through a lot of Mutations. In fact, I um, I forced them on Maria at one point in a different form than where they ended up. It took a while to figure out how you make it into a book. But friends of mine were saying, "Oh no, this should be a book," and I couldn't. I thought, "Well, how can it be a book? It's it's just random stuff that happened to an eleven-year-old." So it took me a pretty long time to figure out how to make a beginning, a middle, and end, and also a through line. Because you know, when you're living your life, I mean, you are living a story, but you're not so sure what that story is for a, a lot of it till you really review it. You know, it doesn't. At least my life didn't um, didn't seem to add up. Especially these diaries, they didn't add up to a story that I could put my finger on exactly. So, um, so anyway, once I had a whole lot of these pages illustrated, I started. Uh, at some point, I showed them to a publisher who offered me a book deal, and I thought okay, now I have to make them into a book. And so I did. And so you started illustrating them. And did, what, what kind of things did you find out? Like what insights did you get about your past uh, reading through the books? Well, one, one thing that was interesting to me is that this, uh, your memory is really um, up for grabs. Like, uh, things that I have a page, in fact, I can find it if we want to, if I want to start messing with screen share again. Um, uh, I had a page, well, let me see if I can, if I can tell me if you, if you are, am I on it? No, you're no? on the last one. You're, but we've already seen that one. All right, uh, this uh, one, we're seeing too many of them. This is, um, well, this is my analysis of the way that memory works because um, this is, this is something I remembered, this horrible sandwich, which, uh, <laughs> was just something I ate when I went on vacation with my parents. But then this was a page that said, one of the worst days I've ever known. 
which I would think should be seared into my memory, but I can't remember anything about it at all. And I thought that was kind of interesting, just the stuff that you remember and the stuff that you don't remember. Like um, this, I, I wouldn't have remembered this if you gave me sodium pentothal. It was, the words whirly whirler and humdingas, you know, I would like to have remembered them. They're so great, but, uh, but I didn't remember them. That's the interesting thing about your memory, which um, brings us to this. I, I started doing a little research on the brain and what it saves and that everything in your brain that is a, becomes a long-term memory goes to some place called the hippocampus. So I started thinking, well, it would be nice to take a visit to the hippocampus and find out what the selection process was. And then I realized it was the words hippo and campus. So I started doing drawings of ha me having a conversation with a hippo. And that's, <laughs> that's in the book too. And now I'm going to end my screen share again. Am I back? Yeah. I thought one of the super interesting things about the book was just ruminating on um, memory and you, you um, after the picture of that disgusting sandwich, you wrote, it appears that the hippocampus favored feelings of disgust over feelings of benign boredom because I can still remember the disappointing sandwich, but that nice theater of the sea has disappeared entirely. Yeah, that was, it was, uh, it was just weird. It, it was weird that I, I remembered, I'd say, about half of the diary and then about the other half of it, I wasn't sure if I was remembering anything or if I had just looked at the page in the diary so often that I'd made up a memory, you know? It, so that was where it w was sort of fun for me to illustrate is I was trying to imagine what actually happened that caused me to write the stuff down. So that was fun. It was fun to be drawing again too. I went and got a master's degree in art and I haven't done any drawing particularly for like 35 years, so. And it makes me cool. happy. I also never thought I'd have the patience to do things like this. Well, you had to really totally teach yourself how to do this graphic novel and just how to figure out how to do it. Yeah, I I did. I I yeah, it was a confusing process and um it helped when I learned how to do digital drawing, which is this greatest gift to an artist. I mean, I didn't think I'd ever like working with digital drawing equipment, but here's the thing that somebody should have won a Nobel Peace Prize for, the undo button. Like if you're doing artwork and you're drawing on paper, every time you screw up, you have to throw the thing out and start over or, I mean, you can't really erase the mistakes you made if you've inked it. With digital stuff, you press the undo button and you just go back to before you made the mistake. It's just the greatest thing. Um. I want to ask you about the Jilmer Club, which everybody is, wants to know about the Jilmer Club. Everybody, <laughs> no, nobody wants to know about the Jilmer Club. <laughs> the Jilmer Club is because it really got me. Yeah, the Jilmer Club was um, that was I recorded all the meetings in these diaries. It was a club that I started with my friend Jill, oddly enough, and uh, we had meetings and we collected dues and. Uh, and the, the meetings that I recorded in the, in the book, I, I, of course, remembered the Jilmer Club because this persisted for a pretty long time. And the meetings were sort of um, the bare minimum of a meeting. Like one meeting I recorded was just that uh, we had to call the meeting um, to a close because there were too many flies. <laughs> Which, <laughs> is this, what I liked about this stuff was that it really isn't the kind of stuff that I would ever record now, you know, I mean, and then actually diaries change. I mean, th this book goes from early childhood through to the end of high school. And by the time I got to high school, I had turned rebellious and then diaries changed entirely for me. It became a book where I was seeking comfort and giving myself support and um, just being a whole other uh, way with it. I didn't, I wasn't writing down every, every movie I saw and every book I read and stuff. And um, maybe that's too bad, but that but it, it became really a, like a comfort system later. Um, one of the things that I really related to is just the the um, you know for the for the women in the audience, there's something about having that best friend in that weird little world that you get into with your best friend where you must have thought you were hilarious like our geniuses for coming up with Jilmer. 
we were laughing all the time at that club. There was basically no club. It was, we were collecting dues and then, uh, and we were laughing and then we would, uh, there was snack time. We ate a lot of snacks. Uh, that was pretty much, uh, but we were very proud that it was a club. <laughs> um, now, did you do the, the I wanna talk about the um, psychiatrist um, uh, clinic. Right, I can do a screen share on that if I can figure out where I put it. Let me see. Nope, this is me while we're on it. This is me imagining whether or not me at the other age would have thought I was cool or not. And, uh, and I'm imagining that we wouldn't have gotten along very well at all. Did you see anything in the kid that you're still, that still, like, did you get triggered at all by stuff, behavior of the kid? Um, yeah, the kid was, was really naive and um, clueless. <laughs> this is what, what she was. I, I, I started writing myself into panels with the kid and having a talk with her. For instance, um, when I was uh, in the beginning of these diaries, I was very, very much in love with a guy who was in my fourth grade class. And I was in love with him all the way to sixth grade. And when he saw me, he used to do a Nazi salute. And I didn't see that as an insult. I'm Jewish. And I, just, I don't know how I could have been so clueless as to not associate a Nazi salute with any kind of an insult at all. I thought it was the guy um, finding a way to get my attention and that he was, that he was paying attention to me. And, uh, and that, that was when I started writing myself into the panel to have a talk with her and just go, wait a minute, what? <laughs> you did what? So, uh, so there's a lot of panels in here where I am talking to myself in two different ages. But this thing you're looking at was in, by eighth grade, I had decided to just play the comedy card pretty hard. And I was, uh, you know how little boys will imitate a superhero. I was imitating Lucy from Peanuts and I put up a psychiatric stand. This I thought was a good way to meet boys is that you would just put up the psychiatric stand and I would give them Rorschach tests. And then no matter what they said, I would tell them that they had mental problems. <laughs> that was my idea because I was getting my flirtation ideas from Mad Magazine, which was my most influential reading at the time. And I'm getting off of the share now. So that was the Perko. So Perko, by the way, was like Jilmer. It was uh, a friend of mine and I, Perko was, I'm Co, and she was Pernick. So it was like Jilmer, but it was last names. Gotcha. I was very good with the club names. Um, some of the other things that really got me was you t uh, talk about the doctor telling you to lose weight in 1960 and your mother buying into that. And I just wanted to, <laughs> just because I also, you know, how much time we all spend thinking about our weight and that it just really got me that a doctor would bring that up and, you know, you were a little kid. You know, there was, a, I, I, I limited the content of this book to stuff I recorded because I just thought, okay, this is stuff that was documented, therefore it can be proven to be true on some level. I didn't just go with normal memories, but, um, but I remember from that same period, dentists were not using Novocaine on me. If you can believe that, did you ever have that happen? Me? Yeah. No, but my dad was an orthodontist and he um, used to it, like be really mean to kids. It was, he was like a children's dentist and then an orthodontist and he was not very patient or nice with kids, but no, he did give my dad. But I, yeah, this doctor told me I was overweight and that was a point at which I was about, I wasn't very much overweight. I was maybe 15 pounds overweight, 10 pounds. But at that point, I went on a diet. I was about 10, I'd say, and I, 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 maybe I got off it last week for a little while. <laughs> but it just totally ruins everything. I got one of those little calorie books that they sell at the supermarket checkout. And you look it up to see what calories are. You're told you shouldn't go over 900 calories. And uh, I looked it up, and a cookie was like 4 million, and a grapefruit was like 40. And you just realize, oh, so I'm never, ever allowed to ever eat another cookie. It was, uh, it was 
one of those moments, a depressing moment. Um, so you also talk about other boys. You sort of mock yourself later on and you say, I wish I could report that I'd given up on human boys. But when my Nazi boyfriend was assigned to a different school, he was quickly replaced by Bobby, another boy who fit my meticulous relationship requirements of showing no particular interest. So as your friend, I'm concerned about you. Is this, is this, is this a pattern that you've had to wrestle with? Or with yeah, it was a pattern. It was, yeah, I never had boyfriends, but I had imaginary boyfriends. I was always in love with these guys and I didn't require any evidence in terms of behavior to continue to fuel my love. Like, you know, if I couldn't be turned off by, by Hitler remarks, I could be turned off by nothing. But I'd say, once I decided that I was in love with you, I was just plain old gonna stay in love with you and nothing could deter my ardor. One of the things that I really related to about this book is just how much you were into pop culture and um i was i watched a ton of tv in my youth you know i i I did some reading too but i was mostly reading nancy drew books and mad magazine i wasn't doing any i keep reading about authors who are reading you know jane austen and all kinds of semi-sophisticated things i i was i would go to the um, newsstand and pour over mad magazine starting at about age 11 and and read it and reread it but um, but yeah, I was I watched so much TV. I had the schedule memorized. Did you do that? What? I have the schedule memorized for TV. I, I would have it memorized, or I would like take the TV guide and mark stuff <laughs> you know, that I knew I wanted to watch. Um, the TV guide was like a a real book. I actually had had a scene early on, a flashback in Romy and Michelle, where they were going through and I and you know um, highlighting the TV shows that they wanted to watch that week and I used to send away for old TV guides to remind me of you know what yeah you know what I just was looking through a TV guide because I'm going to do a um, somebody's podcast who analyzes TV guides from various periods did you know they used to list the writers of shows in TV guide nope I did not know that at some point in the 60s, they would say, Hawaiian Five O, written this week by Jack Laird and Bill. Wow. You know, how amazing is that? That sounds like a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were honoring writers. They thought writers meant something at that point. So you say at some point by now, pop culture had become the glue that held my life together. And this was in reference to all the kids shows. Do you think oh, yeah. that's true about you now? What's your relationship with pop culture like now? I try to stay on top of it. I usually ask you <laughs> what you're watching and then I write it down. <laughs> I, I try to stay on top of the stuff that's any good, but I mean, as we all know, there's so many things now to watch that you, you barely get to a fraction of it. I still like it. I, I, you know, yeah, I still really like it. I actually feel like a show that you're crazy about uh, is Pen15. Yeah, I love Pen15. I think that is a magic trick. I've never seen anyone do those two 35-year-old women or however old they are playing 13 in a cast full of 13-year-olds. That's a real magic trick and it's they do a great job. They do a great job, but it's also remind when I was reading your book, I it stirs up the same kind of feelings. Yeah, I thought so when I watched, I just watched season two and I thought, yeah, there's some overlap here. Right, there is. And it's interesting because they were writing about, I think they're writing about the 90s. They have phones that have the, an antenna on them, you know, a big portable phone. So that makes me think that, you know, wasn't that different in the 60s and the 90s. It's the same weird crap. One thing that is different, thank God, is like you talk about in Campfire Girls and also in school about having all those Pomac and girls learn to cook and sew and all of that. And yeah, it was, um, I was in Girl Scouts, were you? I was in Campfire Girls. Oh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't remember. There's one of the memories that was gone until I reread them. I was in Girl Scouts for sixth grade, I guess, for the whole year. But our meetings were all about um, learning how to cook eggs and 
<laughs> whatever the uh, Juliet Lowe, the creator of the Girl Scouts, had in mind, I don't think the word scout really perfectly capsulizes the idea of uh, learning to cook eggs. It's sort of a whole, a whole demented way of looking at Girl Scouts. We never did anything at all remotely scouty. We watched a movie on graduation. I got punished a lot. You did? Yeah. I got punished a lot too because I was because uh, Jilmer was in the uh, in the troop with me and we were always talking and that was considered well, keep time. quiet while you're learning about eggs sometimes for making fun of people um, <laughs> <laughs> so otherwise you go brain dead I mean if you've got a troop like that one of the things that I really relate to that I I want to talk about and one of the things that's really been um, helping me survive during the pandemic is to tap into my creativity. And I wanna just talk about, well, let's just first talk about your relationship to humor and when you started realizing that you could be funny and. I've always been like that, have you? I've, I mean, I really honestly, I, I was always playing that card, but I never, I started playing it harder and harder as I got older. Um, it was, Comedy was always the thing that I loved most ahead of everything. It was, and then when I decided I was going to try to write, I never considered writing any other kind of content. I mean, it was just what came naturally. I think that what, when you're a certain age, and I'm thinking that age when you start defining yourself as about puberty, maybe 12, 11, before that, yeah, I mean, certainly in my diaries, I was nobody. And then I started turning into a smart ass. And I think it's because you play the hand you're dealt, kind of. Like if you are the prettiest girl in the class, you find that that has a certain kind of power and you start to use it where you can to, to get power. And um, in my case, I, I realized that I can make people laugh. So that was, um, that was a cool thing to be able to do. And also I loved it. I just, I started buying comedy books and comedy, I watched, you know, I was watching sitcoms and they were never very funny, but I guess I was pretending they were funny. Those sitcoms from the 60s and 70s, that stuff wasn't too funny. There was funnier stuff on like albums. I liked that Mel Brooks album, um, The 2000 Year Old Man. And yeah, that was great. Yeah, stuff like that was very inspiring to me. We all hmm? listened to Bill Cosby when we were little. Well, and yeah, the, all the, all of our heroes from that period have to be shamed. Horrible people. I mean, Woody Allen. I was so into Woody Allen. I know. All right, we're gonna not go down this. No. What we do at dinner when we're having dinner, we start <laughs> going down a rabbit hole and pull ourselves out. Um, <laughs> it, but you say something interesting in your book. You say re, uh, rethinking the world is rethinking the world is com in comedy was like a magic trick where I was in control. I could turn something I didn't like into something I liked a lot. It was like an escape tunnel. Yeah, I have a, I have a screen share of that. Let's see if I can do it. There it was. This, this is what co creativity looks like to me. I, my whole life I grew up watching Wiley e. Coyote and others. I think Bugs Bunny did it too. Paint a tunnel on a mountain, and then somebody, in the case of Wiley e. Coyote, it was Rug Runner, runs through it. And that's what creativity always seemed like to me, as you just fashion uh, an imagine an escape tunnel in a place where there is no escape, and you walk through it, and you change everything about the way life is. I mean, you feel like you're powerless in a situation, but you reframe it entirely, so you're the person holding all the cards. It's its the greatest thing, in, in my opinion. Well, even like I remember even when my dad was dying, um, just observing what was going on, having that weird thing where I was like, even that, in that moment, I was going, huh, this is interesting. I wonder, you know, uh, just observing yourself and observing what's going on at all times. Like, can I use this at some point? It's the, well, that's the reason I save stuff. I, I, it's the gift of being a writer. I mean, I can't imagine living any other way. I see everything 
as something that you are going to need to use at some point because human experience is so universal. I was in the hospital and I made drawings every single day of what the nurses look like and I made notes. So I knew I was going to forget it all. And it's an amazing thing to look at because I did, I forgot it all. But I don't, every time I look at it, I go, oh, that guy, you know, it's, it's a very cool, creativity is, to me, I don't know how anyone lives without it. It's the greatest gift. I don't, I don't understand either. Um, you know, and I, and I, and I hope that people, you know, I hope people get inspired to do anything that you do that is creative, especially right now. Yeah. It's, it's just um, completely saving me. Um, all the way back in 1965, you wrote, I might want to write a book. The whole world seems so full of screwed up stuff, but maybe if I can charge through it, writing what I see, it will still be a meaningful life. I find that extremely moving. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I, I was writing notes to myself um, like that. Yeah, and it turned out I was right. I haven't changed as much since that period where I was, you know, solidly a teenager. I, I'm nothing like the kid who was in high, but I'm a lot like the, the rebellious goofball in the high school. It, some of that stuff just stays, I guess the stuff that is useful and that you like stays with you. You make some decisions about who you are at that point, which, uh, and I always just, I always liked that. It didn't help me get along with my parents, but, um, you know, yeah, I'm still happy I do that. I'm going to open this up to questions if anybody has any questions. Let's see what the chat says. You saw scenery, Heim. No, no, but can your brother is still gleeful that he threw up on the dentist. I think that's, yeah, the dentist deserved it totally. Um, yeah, no Novocaine. I remember they yelled at me too. I was saying, this is really, I mean, that's why dentists have such a bad reputation. The guys that I go to now are completely painless, but you have that initial memory of it being a horror show. Um, well, I wanted to talk about, just in relation to your, um, your uh, Perco, psychiatrist thing that you thought that it was going to make you attractive that you were funny yeah um, guys love the hilarious women don't they they just it's nothing attracts guys faster than a smart ass i realized um bethany wants to know mira where are your pups right now uh the pups are in the house that's if they were in here they'd be uh making themselves known and it would be really very hard for me to keep staring into this camera. The way we're set up, I have to keep looking not at Robin, but looking up there, and I'd be looking down here. I'm totally overrated. As a writer, does humor come naturally, or is it something that requires a lot of effort and revision? Great question. Uh, both things. It's I, What I always find, and I would recommend to anybody, is, you, well, you have to have... Um, ideas, but just write drafts of stuff. If you can force yourself to write just a horrible draft of something, then you the next pass is way easier because it's almost kind of fun to rewrite. You know, that's when you can get out of a thesaurus, you can cut stuff out and throw it away. But the first draft is really hard. So don't hold yourself to any kind of reasonable standards on the first draft, just let it be horrible. And you do that. I do that. Do you do that? I do. It's, you know, in, in some ways, while you're doing it, you think, well, this is nothing. How can it be anything? Look at what a mess I'm making. But then when I read back over it, I think, oh, this is a good part. You know, I mean, it's, you just have to start and keep going. And then, and then if you can get through to the end, even of a horrible draft, you're in pretty good shape. It's a great feeling. It's such a great feeling. Because yeah. you have something to react to. I, I've yeah. done, you know, eventually re done a complete rewrite on something, but still it helps to have the, the vomit draft. Um, but I've also done something ridiculous where I've done so much rewriting that I put it back in a first draft. <laughs> it's just, I kept rewriting and rewriting because there's only just so many ways that you, a specific distinct individual, have to say anything. You haven't got an infinite amount of ways. So once you've been through a lot of them, 
you know, you don't need to keep, I kept, I had one draft of a thing where I kept changing and to but and just to so and stuff like that. And it just, it doesn't, that stuff really only matters kind of, you know, the, the other thing I have to say on this topic is that I don't know about you, but I, I write, when I read my own writing back, it has a kind of a music to it when yeah, I've yeah. just written it. And it reads kind of like, and you forget that music if you put the thing down and don't look at it for a while. So then when you go back to it, that song isn't playing and you can go, wow, well, this is awfully long here at the top. The music carries it, you know, when you're, when you're writing it. So you have to walk away from it long enough so that you don't, um, you don't still hear that song. Um, question for you from John. Speaking of parents, what advice would your adult self give to your parents on parenting you? Uh, to have a sense of humor. <laughs> that would be all that was required. I think there are only two things. I've never had kids. I didn't have kids because my mother looked like she hated it. And, uh, and it was a, a revelation to me later in life to see that some people really enjoy having kids. It just looked like a, a terrible burden to both of my parents that they had to tolerate. Um, but I, when I look back on it, it seems to me that there was only two things I required to get along with them. One, um, reinforcement to occasionally go, hey, good job. And the other would be to understand that you're a transitional human being and, and to have a sense of humor about it. I mean, my parents had no sense of humor about um, anything, any flaws that I had. They, everything was critical and, and it was, it's a stupid way to be, you know, to this day, I don't think they were right. Um, it, it caused a need, needless hostility for no reason because I was wearing the wrong shoes. You know, I let your kid wear the wrong shoes. What's, so what, you know? And, Where did your but, sense of humor come from, do you think? Um, the, the stuff I liked, I was starting, I, at some point when I did, it didn't occur to me that you could actually write comedy. It's like you said, when you saw me on the show and it occurred to you, you could be a, a comedy writer. It didn't occur to me until I was, I got a job teaching art at USC and I started hanging around their film department, excuse me. And, uh, and I was auditing screenwriting and I was auditing basic filmmaking and stuff. And that was the beginning of because I was on faculty, I was allowed to do this stuff. That was the beginning of me realizing that it was a career at all. It, I thought, well, the people in show business are all related somehow and they give each other jobs because they know each other and um, there's no way to even consider it as a job. And then when I learned about spec material and stuff and I moved down here, um, I started really sort of studying things and then I started reading and looking for people to model myself after. The, the ones that I liked best were the Algonquin Roundtable guys. The, um, not just Dorothy Parker, but I really, really loved Robert Benchley, who uh, was a combination that I realized is the thing that I, I seek and try to do most, which is a combination of cerebral and silly. It's um, both things equal. Like I don't like either one too much, but, but I really, it has to be kind of cerebral for me to, find it silly. But this, the, the hippocampus stuff. Yeah, the hippocampus stuff, but, um, but just any, even to this day, there's not any joke or anything I write that doesn't have to have some slightly brainy component for, for me to take off on. Otherwise, I don't find it that funny. You know, I don't really like just low brow humor, particularly. Um, here is a question. Oh, this is um, from our friend Maria Semple. How do you think it's different for women breaking into comedy now than when you were starting out and what's the same? We should ask Maria that question. <laughs> um, uh, from, I, you know, I think it's, uh, the internet has changed everything in such a radical way for some in some ways it's made stuff really easier you like the research element is unbearably better i mean my goodness you you know it used to be you'd have to go in the library and sit and look for volumes and then go through the book looking for a detail and you can just find anything you want online by just putting in keywords and stuff so that part is great i think if i were a kid now um and thought i wanted to go into comedy i would totally be putting stuff 
on YouTube and TikTok and, um, and all those platforms, that would be the good part. The bad part would be that a million weird people would be commenting on them and hurting my feelings. And, um, and so uh, that's just, a, I'm so like, for instance, these diaries, I probably would have been writing a diary online and really mean people would have been telling me I was an idiot. So I'm kind of glad that, uh, that I didn't have social media that way. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. I think it's uh, certainly women in comedy. There's a lot more of them. Wouldn't you agree, Robin? I mean, the the world, like the world of stand up. When I was doing, uh, started out doing stand up, there was a few, very few women, and now there's a ton of really, really funny women doing stand up. So that better in the last couple of years. I think probably Amy Schumer helped. Um, there's a number of big breakthrough people, and they, yeah. I, I don't know if it's easier or harder. It's still hard. It's, the, it, you know, for every moment that you hear that things got better, and the same is true of feminism. For every moment that you hear that things have suddenly taken a leap in the right direction, you hear that things have suddenly taken a leap in the wrong direction again. So it's a, it's a battle that, that you fight. You have to fight. You have to find your way you have to kick your way through barriers. There, women are not really equal in this society, let's face it. You know, there's a lot more discussion of it, but there was a lot of discussion of it when I was in college and it all rolled backwards. Um, somebody just wanted to know when you sketch and take notes now, like when you were in the hospital, do you do that on paper or digitally? Moleskin or iPad? I think now I would do iPad, but I was doing it I was doing it on paper when I was in the hospital because I hadn't learned how to get, I, ha I hadn't bought the iPad and didn't learn how to do Procreate yet, which is the name of the program I've been using. And there may be a better program, but it certainly is, that one's a great one. It's, it's very fun. That I, the Apple Pencil changed everything. That, that's a genius invention. Um, Meg Wolitzer wants to know, do you read a lot when you're writing? And if so, what? Meg Wolitzer, wow, we have a fancy audience. Um, do I read a lot when I'm writing? Um, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. It depends on how manic I am about the writing. Like sometimes I get into crazy times where I can't stop working and I just work and work and work and work and work. And if I don't have a glass of wine or something, I can't turn it off. I just I'm just in overdrive. I get up early and I stay up late. And sometimes it's a struggle. And then in those times, sometimes I read and actually it can be undermining because I read stuff that I think is really, really good. And then I think, well, they're so much better than I am. What am I even trying to do anything for? <laughs> so it, it depends. It's not the best time to be reading really. I don't think when you're writing. What do you think, Robin? You're writing right now. Writing, I really watch just like crappy TV, or if I read, I don't tend to read literary novels. I, I just- You do read some literary novels though. You've purchased some for me recently. I did? Mm-hmm. You bought me Sally Rooney. Oh, that's right, yeah. You bought me the one where some uh, kid was on fire. I forget the name of it. It's a really nice graphic for the cover. Yeah. Uh, nothing to see here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that and, you bought, and you bought me um, Meg Wolitzer's book and Maria Semple's book. Why not give them a plug? <laughs> um, do you still write first thing in the morning before the caffeine kicks in? No, I write while the caffeine is kicking in. But I do write first thing in the morning. I think that was a, a very smart innovation that I learned from Mr. Andy Preboy, with whom I live. It's because it, here's my assessment of why it's a good time for me anyway, is your, um, you know, the right brain and the left brain, which is an oversimplification of the way the brain really is. A real brain scientist will tell you it, not the case, but, but theoretically, the right brain is intuitive and the left brain is kind of math and homework and organizational skills. And the left brain has all that critical voice on it, I've found. And I've found, I think it comes to life slower than the right brain. I wake up with my right brain going, but my left brain doesn't kick in until about 11 or 12 in the afternoon. 
when it starts to say, uh, what, what are you doing? This is horrible. It doesn't do that until later in the day. <laughs> so early in the day, I get hours off where I can actually reinforce myself. And, and that's why I do it early in the morning. Um, this is from Arturo. And we'll take one after Arturo. I really love your comment about not being able to really remember what you felt during your childhood. How would you guide someone who would like to explore their own childhood in their own work? And you didn't, and I assume he didn't keep any writings. That's the weird thing is that I wrote down everything. So that was what I made this book is only stuff I wrote down because your own, your memories are sketchy. You know, you don't, and I've also been told that if you, I'm guessing from the way that question is phrased that there's memories missing. And I was told that that um, has something to do with childhood depression. I'm missing big chunks of it too. And I think it was, particularly depressing periods. Although, you know, some people have, everybody's memory is different. I would, how would you do it? Um, I would just say, right, start writing. Start that, writing. But I would what I would do. Uh, I would recommend Linda Berry's book, What It yes. Is. And yeah. she has a couple books about writing and creativity. And she has suggestions and exercises in these books that will tap you into to childhood memories. So, yeah, she. That what it is is that is um. A, it's a gorgeous book too. Yeah. It's about creating images. It's um, but I would just start keeping a journal and start asking yourself what happened. Start, start that way. Um. Last question: Which artists or cartoonists are the most influential for the style of your current work? Well, weirdly, my current work looks like my work. It's. It turns out that you have, if you, I went to six years of art school and it turns out I have a style of drawing and it's, I'm stuck with it. It's kind of like handwriting. You know how you can't really redo your handwriting. It keeps coming back to where you are. I mean, I can, I can do it. I can do different levels of realism and stuff, but I have a signature way that I draw and it was too much work to try to redo it. So my drawings kind of look like my drawings, but the the artists that I really, really admire, I love Roz Chast. I like Mimi Pond. I like Daniel Klaus a lot. Um, he, his drawings are sort of mind bogglingly detailed. He, he crystallizes facial expressions that I've actually stood in the mirror and tried to make them to see what he was, what he's trying to convey. They're so specific, you know, he really, he can really draw. And those are the three that come to mind. Um, oh, and Crum, you know, Crumb, but I mean, Crumb is so, I don't like Crumb's content nearly as much as I like um, Roz and Mimi and Linda Berry. Linda Berry was inspiring in just how brutally frank she is. And then Robin and I both took a workshop from her once. We did, that I highly recommend it. I just wanna read this one um, thing because it, I relate from Carrie. I asked other friends who, we, who, who were young with me and found that it takes three of us to remember one event. Is, but that is definitely another thing you can do is just get together with your friends and see if memories come back, if you know people from your childhood. That's interesting. Three, so you get, th you get a group consensus on what happened. <laughs> Well, that's true, though. It's different for each person. It's, that would be a great way to, to, well, that's sort of like writing in a writer's room on television as you get all the different perspectives and you make a, you make a picture. But what, the thing that was funny to me about these diaries was just that they were, um, they were just matter of fact. So I was just, I thought the way I'm going to do the book is just accept that they're true and see if I can visualize them. And because why would I have written them down if they weren't? true and they didn't seem untrue they were just so that's funny three people to make a memory i'll have to think about that that's a family memory quorum <laughs> um great well i really love this book i highly recommend it for anybody who wants to remember that time in their own lives in addition to this kind of beautiful journey that you go on to the discovering your you know your creativity kind of is your survival mechanism and i found that very moving 
Well, thank you. I really appreciate that, um, that you said nice things. That makes me feel really good. I'm Anna, babe. I'm Anna. Hmm? No. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Please consider purchasing a copy of We Saw Scenery at Pals Books and Pals.com. We really look forward to seeing you at one of our events again soon. Meryl and Robin, thank you so much. We're really grateful to you both. Well, thank you, Kim. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.